moving on, we've got half an hour left. Okay, so once you, you know, we don't want to just print how many slices an image has or print hello world. You actually want to do image J type things. So how do you get the right commands? So there's this lovely thing called the macro recorder. So if you go plug in macro record, a little window like this will pop up. And you would use this when you, you know, probably know how to do it. But what's the code needed to do that? So, you know, say you're writing a script and you want to open the image in Mac project. Well, I showed you the full command for Mac projection or Z projection before with Max. Um, you could maybe fumble your way through with autocomplete to find it, but the easiest is to just do it. Have the recorder running, open an image. It'll do all the steps and it will give you all the commands that you did. Um, so that's, you know, good for when you know how to do something. So here we're going to do like an example. I've opened this image called blobs and I want to duplicate blobs and make a new window called copy. And I'm going to run a medium filter. So we're going to blur copy. That's a blurry. And then we're going to segment it. So we're going to threshold it. Looks pretty good. I could manually screw with things or just use one of the defaults. Hit apply, and now I've got my binary image. So these would be nuclei, bacteria cells. Use your imagination. You could then measure some of them roughly just to get an idea of how big they are. And that's a little bacteria or something that I don't want. So I know now my rough range of what I do want, what I don't. So I bring up analyzed particles. And I don't want zero to infinity, I want something like 50 to infinity, because I know that 50 will get not the little thing, but only the big stuff. And now I've got these, right? And it exports. I, I measure all the stuff. And I want to go back to my raw image and actually measure all of the ROIs. So yeah. you know, hypothetically, Let's pretend that it was like these are nuclei, and I need to find the nuclei and then go and measure how much they all are in some other channel, right? So I get this big results table, and I could take that results table to Excel or something down the track, right? So that's kind of what the command would look like. So there's this example image, duplicate it, blur it, um, run the threshold of moments, and then you know run the convert convert the mask, analyze the particles. Dropping them into the ROI manager, so like add to the ROI manager. Then you go back and select the original image, and then I selected one of the ROIs, then I want to go and select all of them. So it's with this many, and then turn on a number of measurements, actually measure it and save the results. Save that. So that's all the commands basically for that little video I played. Now this probably won't run if you just drop that straight into the PG macro, but it's good, you know, you probably don't know what the analyzed particles with the size of 50 to infinity, what the actual command string looks like. So if you just did that, copy that bit into you know your loop or something, it'll work. Right? So this is that's one way to develop the code because you probably know what you want to do. When you're testing, you might have to go through a number of steps to go. Well, which threshold should I use? What cutoff size should I use? And you'll be doing these things anyway. And to get in the habit of opening the recorder window, because it's you know useful. Um, so sometimes there is also this tool in PG called um, the batch process. Maybe you don't need a full macro. Maybe it is just as simple as like open image, run Z projection, and, and do that for a whole folder of images. So in this case, if I open the image, which was called this, and then I reset the brightness and contrast, so set me to max display range, zero to 12 bit, and then run projection max, display it as composite. Now, that's not that complicated. You probably don't need that. You can just use this batch. So if you took these commands and put them into the this batch processor, it kind of handles the 
here's a folder that I'm going to look for images in, and here's a folder I want to put them in. Um, so it is possible, right? But you probably don't want a command that says select this specific window because it's not going to be called that file every time. It's probably going to be something like control O one, and then this um, symbol or this string. So you don't want that. Uh, another way is there's command finder, or as someone pointed out, find command. I think what it's called now on the new Mac version, at least, is you can kind of type in it's searchable and helps you find stuff. This is probably a little bit obsolete now that the extension, uh, the autocomplete in the IDE is um, is there. That's what this is. So you've obviously all been typing. If you've got a new version of Fiji, you'll see that it starts typing it autocompletes. It gives you a nice little text example. And if you click the, the hyperlink, it'll take you to the full web documentation, which this is just scraping, so the same thing. But that will show you all the commands. And as some people may have noticed as well, especially with the last exercise, for common things, it will auto-populate. So, you know, if you start typing four, it'll give you a little generic for loop, or it'll also do ones for like how many results, how many slices. So it's really helpful. <coughs> One other thing that's really nice in the latest versions is if you define a variable, it'll know and populate autocomplete with the variable that you define. So then you don't have silly spelling mistakes and things like that, where you go, why did this not work? And you're looking at them and they both look the same, but Someone before had zero instead of the letter O. Not obvious sometimes. So the autocomplete variable is really nice. Some common commands um, get title. So I like to use this variable window title equals get title. Um, and then you might say, like, select window, this window title. So say you opened an image and it's called control.hit image dot and then you max project it now bg is going to call that new window max underscore image dot right so if i wanted to go back to my original image i opened i could say you know select whatever that is i could make a new one called window title after max and then run that same command and then select it later so when you're coding and using the macros, you start to kind of imagine in your head what's happening in BG and which window you want to be selecting to measure on and which, you know, where you want to do things. So that's two useful commands. Close is another one, keep things tidy. Um, and then run measure, so that runs the measure command. Run clear result, clear the result table. I showed you before how you clear the log window with the slash slash clear and the clicking command. So they're, they're just useful things um, that we'll use in the coming exercise. Um, something as well, just as like a reminder, we've got these like get time with no argument, single argument things. Uh, where, and you can also have like, this can be used in a for loop, or you can also just define a variable that and then you can have your for loop refer to that. You know, can help um, with debugging. Sometimes, if you run multiple of these functions, so we, we encountered the get dimensions before or get the same time. And what this is doing is you've got this unit pixel width, pixel height. And these are basically like collections of variables that it will populate with whatever the image has or the settings were. Some of them do use the same thing. So it assigns the pixel unit to the variable unit and the pixel width, etc. But there's another one that's like get image size and it also has it and it defines a different. So like just be careful with the overriding of variables. Um, Hopefully you're aware now that like we can, the way Fiji works is it turns like all of this into a string and then it resolves it. 
So if we had this user chosen median equals three, we can run the median command that it then would resolve to or interpret as that, right? So you can have like a pop up box that's giving us how blurry do you want your image? Pick a number between zero and two five bucks and it's ready for job. Um, another useful thing is you'd have this path and then you can say get directory and it pops up the operating systems like file navigator. So, you know, you're probably going to want to have a script that's like, where's your file that you want to run on? You don't want to go in and get like the full text string to be like run on this folder exactly. Oh, that's just annoying. So you can also like kind of core operating system commands. Um, so yeah, the get directory, which is the directory. So if we assume that we pick a folder on the desktop called my data, um, we could say, then get the date and time. We saw that before. This is slightly old. Um, the new date and time has the day of month. See what that is. This still works. Um, we could create a variable called results directory, and that would be within our folder that we chose to work on, some folder called results with the date and time. And then we can run this command called make directory, and then that makes that folder. So that would interpret saying, I'll make a folder in the desktop, my data with the results. And you can see when I clearly wrote these slides. Um, does that make sense, people? Couple of tips. I don't think they're written. They're not on another slide. Um, when you make a new like results folder, if you put underscore, underscore is like the first in the list, but it'll always result to the top. So if you've got a folder with 100 images, you don't really want the thing with the result at the right bottom. Then you have to go to that folder, scroll all the way down to the top. If you're lazy, just go here. Another thing is having this year, month, day, or some kind of Sometimes I go down the second into the file name is because it'll always make a new folder every time. Because the reality is you're going to have a script and you're going to set up all these things, run it, and then it's going to crash. But it's already made a directory. And then you want to run it again once you fix that error. And then if you're like me, but we have another error and it'll crash again. And so rather than overriding on the same folder every time, because Sometimes the way Fiji crashes, it doesn't close the folders, and you might get some error. Like, I can't delete that folder because it's in use. So that's because Fiji is broken and it's still holding it in them. So if you just keep making new folders, you won't have that problem. Also, if you are saving like a spreadsheet and then you open that spreadsheet and go, oh crap, nothing wrote into that spreadsheet. I forgot to print something in there or something. And then you go and run the script again, it's going to crack it and go, I can't edit that spreadsheet because you've got it open in Excel. Whereas if you make the spreadsheet have a new file name every time it runs, once you're finished and you get it working, then you're going to close it. Right? So that's a few tips. Um, we can nest the command. So, what I mean by that is if the results of a command can be directly passed into another command, it doesn't need to be defined as a variable. So we we could have, you know, my result equals get the result of the area. Um, or, so this is going to the results table, looking at the column area and saying, what's the, the top row value? And then I could say print this result. But I could also just say print the results of area on the first one in one single line. This is kind of good for beginners. This will technically run ever so slightly fast. And then that adds up over like a hundred lines of code and you run it a hundred times. Um, but one thing to note is you don't put a semicolon in here when you're trying to resolve this. So we can get information from an image. We can get the title, we can get its dimensions. We can get how many slices between counters. We can get its pixel size and we can get its voxel size. Does everyone know what a voxel is? No, okay. So pixels are 2D. 
if you take a data stack, Voxels is a 3D representation because you have like steps in them. So something just to be aware of is if you run these in order, so this width might tell you, it might be like five plots. Your image might be 512 by 512 pixels. And let's say it's got you know, three channels, 20 slices, two slices, and it's not a time lapse, so very big in one, it's got one time lapse. Uh, and slices is going to give you some combination of whatever that adds up to. And then you can say, well, what's the pixel size? The so X, Y pixel size or voxel size is width, height, and depth of the unit. So you've got unit twice here and you've got width here and width here. So if you ran all of this, you know, here width would equal 512, but by the end, this might equal like one micron because it's being overwritten. At the same variable. If you had like a line print width, right? so you can change these. You can rename so get voxel size. It needs to print out four variables. You can't say I'll oh, get voxel size width. That won't work. You do need four different things separated by commas, but whatever you call these, you can change. So. In the next exercise, we want to open up that same image. It might be different, I can't remember. But open the image file that's provided or the one from the previous exercise. And just, I want to see printing out what's the file name, how many channels it has, what slices it has. Um, and, you know, here the bonus is calculate the width in microns. So the standard width might be. 970 by 970, that's how many pixels. And then you can calculate, or you can get the pixel size and then calculate what the actual width is in my case. Um, basically, I've given you the script, but we, we clear the log window of any junk that was there previously. Get title and then just print get the image title. Dimensions, we saw that we, you know, could get these things and then print them out. And then we can also get the scale. But what can happen when you ask for the voxel width is like the unit overrides. And some of these might have been height previously, which would override some up there. So um, to calculate the total image width, you obviously need how wide each pixel is and then how many pixels there are in the image. And so that can sometimes mean that you need the updated unit. So there's lots of other information that we can get that can be useful in the uh, you know macros and things like that. Perhaps if you're you know using a complex macro and you need to access a certain plugin or need to know that the person who's running it, if it's not yourself, has the right version, you can get the version number. That's quite useful. Um, and images tells you how many images are open. Uh, get time we've covered, that just gets the time in milliseconds. The get date and time we covered, so there's a little bit of a refresher as well. Um, it's got this day of week, day of month now. Note that month is base zero, not base one. So like February is actually month one. That's confusing. Um, and so that's kind of exemplified down here. But I would normally just print like this month plus one. Uh, it's a bit annoying, but that's just kind of the reality. 